everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Delenki, and today we're going to see how uh, we can extend Kubernetes to make you a cup of coffee. So, as I said, my name is Daniel Belenki. I'm a software engineer at uh, Red Hat for the past almost uh, three years. Hi, and my name is Gal. I've been working for Red Hat for the last four years, and my current position is a CI team lead. Uh, and we both are working for the Overt and Kubert projects. Uh, Overt is a virtual, virtual machine manager project, and Kubert is basically an add on for. Uh, Kubernetes that allows you to manage your virtual machines uh, on top of Kuber uh, Kubernetes as well. Okay, so about what are we going to speak today? We're going to give a short overview about what is Kubernetes, uh, explain what is a Kubernetes controller and why do we need it. We are going to show a custom controller that makes uh, coffee. And then we will explain how did we write this controller. Um, our code examples works on Kubernetes and also on OpenShift. OpenShift is Red Hat's enterprise distribution of uh, Kubernetes. So you can run the code on, on both of them. So Kubernetes basically is a piece of software that allows you to deploy and manage container workloads on a group of servers. We call this group of servers a cluster. Okay, so a cluster is a group of servers that can run uh, containers and Kubernetes manages uh, those containers. Uh, I like to see it as a decentralized operating system. And instead of processes, we have containers that run inside of them. Uh, we define to Kubernetes what do we want to run using objects. Those objects are being defined in YAML files. After we post the objects to the cluster, the cluster makes sure that those, uh, the configuration on those, in those objects are being reflected in the, inside of the cluster. Uh, we must, when, we, when we speak about Kubernetes objects, we need to speak about the most simple and basic uh, object, which, which is a pod. So as I said, Kubernetes deploys containers, but it doesn't manage the containers directly. It has an abstraction layer above, the, above them, which is called the pod. A pod can contain one or more containers, and those containers can share the network namespace, the IPC namespace. You can mount uh, files to several containers so they can share files between of them. Uh, and Kubernetes promise you that all the containers inside of a pod will run on the same node server. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, an example of pod manifest. So this is a very basic uh, pod manifest. Every manifest uh, in Kubernetes uh, must have an API version inside of it. Uh, the API version allows us to group different uh, objects, uh, different objects. It must have a kind, because there are multiple kinds or multiple types of objects inside of Kubernetes, so we have a pod. It has a metadata section that describes the object. Each object has a name. And you can, a user can decorate uh, its objects using uh, the annotation field. The annotation field basically gets a map of key value, uh, of key and values. And we can use those annotation later when we add our custom logic to the cluster. For example, when, when we are adding a controller. The most important part of the, of the manifest is the spec section. This is where we define what the, what the pod should, should, uh, should run. So it's an array of containers. Here we have only one container. It's going to use the busybox image and it, it runs hello Kubernetes and print it to STD out. This is, all of, this is the only thing that this uh, pod does. Okay, pods are not perfect. Uh, pods has some limitation and I'm going to describe them. So pods won't survive a scheduling fellow. For example, if there is a momentary uh, error in, the, in Kubernetes scheduler, the pod can, can stack inside of the queue and it won't be scheduled on, on top of a node. If, if we have some pod that runs uh, in a node and we have some hardware failure, some hard disk died, 
So the pod won't survive, it will just stop running. If a cluster operator, someone that manages the cluster, decides that he needs to maintain the node, for example, upgrade its operating system. So he needs to take, he needs to reboot the node, right? After updating, let's say, the kernel. So the pod won't survive it. And maybe someone didn't know that we need the, the pod and it deletes it by mistake. And eviction, it's when the cluster decides that a pod shouldn't run on a certain node. For example, if there is a memory pressure on the node and the cluster decides, okay, I need some memory on this node for other pods, so I will evict the pod from it and uh, we'll, we'll move it to a different node. Okay, so now when we know that pods are not perfect, uh, we can now start to see how controllers can help us to solve those issues. So we will see an example of a replica set controller. A replica set in Kubernetes is a, a, a controller that lets you define a, a certain amount, amount of pods that a, a user wants a, them to be running all the time. And if something happens to one of those pods, for example, they are being uh, deleted or uh, someone adds more uh, pods than needed, so the controller can uh, add or delete pods uh, as uh, needed. So here we can see a replica set control controller running on the cluster with two nodes, and uh, then it schedules uh, one of the pods on node zero. And uh, in this example, we assume that we want only one replica running at any time. So then something happened to node one, uh, node zero, some memory issue, for example, or the disk uh, died. And uh, then the system, uh, the, the, the pod dies uh, with it, of course. And then the Kubernetes system will uh, send the message that the pod was modified, something happened and the replica set controller can intercept it and uh, create an uh, API call to reschedule uh, the pod and the system will uh, uh, reschedule it on a, a healthy node. So let's uh, generalize what controllers are. So basically a controller is a non-terminating loop that listens to events uh, in the cluster and it can react upon uh, the events that it uh, intercepts. So it is the job of a, a controller to move the cluster towards its final desired state that uh, the user uh, has specified. Okay, so how can I write, how can you write your uh, own controller? Let's see the idea that uh, we're going to present here. So we're going to loop indefinitely. We're going to listen to events on pod objects in our cluster. And if a pod uh, will have an expected duration annotation, we will check if this specific event deserves a cup of coffee. And if we will decide that this event uh, deserves a cup of coffee, and we will create a cup of coffee, and then uh, we, because we don't want our developers to die from heart attacks due to too much coffee, we will mark this pod, we will annotate it, and to make sure that uh, we have track on uh, events that we already granted the coffee for them, so. Okay, so I just want to explain from where this uh, idea originated. So our CI system uses Kubernetes in order to run CI workloads, for example, tests, and our test takes a lot of time, and usually what me and Daniel uh, do when, after we run, when we run the test is post the test to the cluster, and then we are going to the kitchen to make coffee and wait for the test to end. So we thought that it would be great if we can automate this process uh, using Kubernetes. So let's see what our custom control coffee maker uh, controller is going to do. So this is the, uh, the, f the first, uh, the basic uh, phase of the, uh, of the cluster. We have one node. And our Kubernetes Kubespresso controller runs inside of it. Uh, as Daniel said, it starts to listen to events inside of the cluster. Now, some user posts a new pod manifest to the cluster. 
and it has the expected duration annotation inside of the manifest. The Cubespresso controller noticed that there is a new pod and it gets uh, the, the information about, the, about this pod and he sees that it has the expected duration annotation inside of its configuration, so he decides to give it a coffee. After he decides to give it a coffee, uh, we want to mark this pod. So the controller modifies the pod and add uh, another annotation that called last coffee granted and it put a time step on it. So we can give coffee to, a, to the developer, one coffee per 24 hours. And a coffee has been granted. Okay, so let's uh, see uh, an actual demo of how uh, it works. So I already have a, a Kubernetes cluster running in my uh, uh, machine. So we will run the Cube Espresso controller. You can see that now uh, it started to listen to events. It found many different events that are already existed in the cluster and uh, processed them, but we can see that none of them uh, was granted a cup of coffee. So now I'm going to deploy a sleeper pod uh, that has the cube, uh, the expected duration uh, 60, 60 annotation. And this pod, what it does, it just goes to sleep when it starts. So it will just uh, give us a cup of coffee. So let's create it. So now we can see that the controller is boiling the water, it's adding sugar, and we're getting our cup of coffee. And we don't have Wi-Fi today, so we don't have a coffee machine interaction. Um, so this is basically the... Yes, this is our emulated coffee. So let's see the code. Okay, so we are going to show the code of the of the controller. Uh, the code is written was written with Python 3.7. So first thing that we need to do is to lo log in into the cluster. Why? Because the controller can see events in the cluster, and as we saw, it can change objects in the cluster. So we need to log in and to make sure that it has the right permissions to do it. Uh, the logic for logging, logging into the cluster exists in Python Kubernetes. This is the main uh, package that we use in order to interact with the cluster. Next, we create uh, an object of the core v1 API uh, class. If you remember when we showed the, the manifest file, it, the first line was an API group. So because we interact with pods, we need to, to create the correct uh, object with the correct API group. Line five is very important. So I want to start, you can see uh, that we pass to the stream function a method which called core v1 API list pod for all namespaces. If I, if I run this method with, without um, passing it to the stream function, the only thing that it will do is to return an array of all the pod objects that currently exist in the cluster. But since I'm passing it to the stream, to the stream method of the watch object, what it does, it opens a stream between the Kubernetes uh, API and our controller, and the Kubernetes API pushes events, or that pushes, pushes pod events to the controller. So, we're constantly reading the events and reacting to them. We create a list of handler. A handler is just a simple function that gets an event and does something with it. Uh, the logger handler is what posted the got event modified, for example, or got event added when Daniel did the demo. And the coffee handler is our coffee maker uh, function. Then, we start an infinite loop and start processing the stream. Uh, one thing, one important thing, a stream is a, generate, is a Python generator. So the loop is very simple. We iterate uh, over the events in the stream 
uh, it's in line three, and then we iterate over each handler and pass the event to the handler. Okay, so now we are inside our coffee handler that you saw before. So the first thing it does, it decides whether or not uh, this event deserves a coffee. Uh, we're not going to show uh, the logic behind this because this is where you can implement your own business logic, decide whatever you want to do and how to inspect the events. And then if it decided that this event deserves a coffee, we will annotate the pod. This is where we are marking the pod object uh, with the last coffee granted timestamp. We need to do it uh, so that we will know which events were already processed and which event uh, we still need to process. We will see this method in a, in a second. And then finally, we call the make coffee method that makes coffee. So here we see the annotate pod method, which will actually mark the pod object. So we, we take, we extract the pod object from the event. We create a, a patch. A patch is basically a dictionary that a partial dictionary that just modifies the section that we want. So here we will have a dictionary that consists of a key that is called metadata and then the annotation that we want to set. And here is where we actually apply the patch uh, on the pod. This is uh, an API call. We will see it as well uh, in, a, in a minute. And if the patch was applied successfully, we will uh, return. And if not, we will say that something uh, happened. Let's see what can happen. So this is the apply patch method. So again, we create the core V1 API so that we will be able to interact with the pod object inside the Kubernetes system. We try to patch the pod with the patch that uh, we were provided with. And in case there was, a, if everything went successfully and the patch was applied, we will return. But if something happened, we need to see what happened. If there was a, a conflict, it means that someone, is, it means that there was a race condition in the system. It actually means that someone modified this uh, pod object before us. It can be another uh, controller that is running on the system. It can be a user that modified it manually. It can be the Kubernetes system itself. Uh, but this is, uh, this case is fine because once a pod is being modified, you will get uh, another uh, uh, event on the stream that this pod was modified and eventually we will get to process the final uh, object. But if the API error was not a conflict, so we will raise this exception so that a, a, the user will know that something uh, very bad happened. So when, when should you write your own controller anyway? Why, why, why should you do it? So there are two main reasons to do it. The first one is when you want to implement your own business logic on top of Kubernetes or OpenShift objects. Uh, this is what we saw today uh, that we, thank you, that we decided that our business logic is to grant developers a cup of coffee whenever a, a certain type of pod is being uh, deployed. And the other reason is when you want to extend the Kubernetes API itself with your types of uh, objects, and then you will need uh, uh, your own controller to manage those uh, objects. Okay, so what did we see today? We did, uh, we, we did, we gave a short explanation about what is Kubernetes. Trust me, one sentence is not enough to describe Kubernetes and I encourage you to go and read about it. It's, it's a great piece of software. Uh, in Kubernetes, the smallest piece that we can deploy is a pod, which is an abstraction of, on top of one or more containers that share some kernel namespace between them. A controller on, in Kubernetes it is a piece of software that listens to events in the cluster and reacts to them. 
Its main uh, purpose is to change the state of the cluster and to move it towards the state that the user want, wants. And the most important thing we saw today that we can write controllers in Python. We don't have to learn Go. We can just use our favorite language to do it. Uh, we've added some of the resources that we used to this presentation. Uh, I believe that this presentation will be available. So you can go and explore those resources. There are, there, there are great stuff over there. And obviously you can see the last line contains a link to a, a GitHub organization that contains uh, the code that we've uh, just uh, demoed. Uh, and it has a readme. It's a, very, it's a one Python, you create a virtual lab and then run the controller and it starts to work. Um, so you can try it yourself. Um, so that's it. That's it. Any, Do you have any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question was, oh, I have a controller, but it can fail. So if it fails, my application does not run. I am not getting coffee. It's too bad. So what uh, monitors the controller? So in this demo, we run the controller locally on our laptop and it, it interacted with a remote cluster. But basically what you do, what you need to do is to deploy the controller, the controller inside of the cluster. And then the controller is part of uh, an object that, that uh, is called deployment. And if you remember, the first controller that Daniel showed, the replica set controller, so the built-in one that comes with Kubernetes, it makes sure that your controller can run. Okay, and there is, um, I, I will, I can give you another example. There is a pattern that you can run more than one, one, more than one uh, controller. So you can run two controllers for your um, application. And then using some consensus algorithm, only one of them reacts to, to events. And, one of, and when one of them fails, the other one uh, takes control and starts to, to react to events. Okay, thank you very much.